This hour is brought to you by Jeremy Temple Law Office of Bloomington. Personal injury, criminal, business, whatever you need, Jeremy Temple Law Office will get you taken care of. Well, we're coming to your city. Gonna play our guitars and sing you a country song. Come on, Orlando, Indiana. Be with Carl Larry here on this Tuesday, February fourth. Course coming to you from the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios. Jim Coyle with you as always. Jake's at the wheel, keep us on the track. And Todd Larry, the running mate, is right here as well. Todd, how you doing, man? Great, great, great. Lots going on. Lots of stuff we didn't talk. Some stuff we didn't talk about yesterday. Super Bowl commercials and the Super Bowl halftime show. Briefly, uh, we'll talk about that. But uh, I want to talk about the Big Ten transfer proposal. It is something that is going to probably be the forefront to the ch- major change in the NCAA. Who's the best player in the Big Ten and the USA for that matter? The AP Top Twenty Five polls out. The net rankings are out, and the Indiana women uh, went up to Purdue last night and got a big win for them, Todd, as they. Uh, try to stay tight in the uh, Big Ten race, but uh, getting a win on the road at Purdue is always sweet. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's they. uh, It's so nice when you go take care of business like that. It's just a good feeling, and it gets it kind of gets you back on track and going and getting a win against uh, you know a team that's Purdue's not bad. They're they're a good team, and they're always well coached, and they have a good following and a good crowd. So, you know, that's just a good solid win. That's one that that separates you from the rest of the field in the in the Big Ten and. You know, it'll put them right up there in that top three range, which is where you've got to be and make a little bit of a run and, you know, hopefully get some help since they had a couple of those early losses to Iowa and Maryland. They need a little bit of help, but uh, definitely taking care of games like that is just hugely important. Yeah, I noticed that uh, for a while, Allie Padberg, who is the so pretty much the leader of the team, I guess you'd say, uh, had kind of, I don't want to say slumped, but uh, wasn't doing as well as she normally has been. But here of late, she's been really knocking it down. And of course, last night she goes for 17 and 9. Uh, nice little stat line. And she had Grace Berger and Jalen Penn backing her up with 15 each. Man, that's a nice support system. And that's, that's great balance for any team. Yeah, there, when you can have three people contribute, you know, that evenly and and it just makes it so difficult. Even two scorers makes it really difficult for a team, I think. And and to have three like that, um, you know, it, it can make it very difficult. And and they can all score in, in, you know, ways that are tough to defend. And once teams start to focus on one of them, you know, the other one is, is fully capable of stepping up and being the leading scorer that night. So that's, they, they've got the abilities and they've got all the pieces. They just, they've got to put it back together. And, um, you know, they just had a little bit of a, a slump and, and hope this is the time of year for them. Cause you know, the women are a week or to 10 days, you know, schedule wise ahead of the men when it comes to big 10 tournament wise. So, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're more into their mid February. If you were talking about men's time frame. Uh, and, and it's time for them to get things rolling. Yeah, they're sitting fourth in the conference right now, I believe. So uh, we'll see how this uh, plays out. Uh, we, we talked about some of those close losses that they had. Just uh, may end up hurting them a little bit in that in that regard. But uh, that's it's going to be a t- tremendous season regardless because I think at worst c- case scenario, I think they end up as a five seed in the tournament. So they'll be in good shape. Yep, they will. They, you know, all they got to do is get themselves there because I think they're one of those teams that could beat anyone. I mean, they've proven it. They beat the number one team in the country uh, earlier this year, and, and that team has kind of solidified itself as number one for a while right now. So they've got the capability to beat anyone. Tim Texan said that they had four busloads of fans that went up there from IU to Purdue to that game. Really? Wow, that's awesome, man. That that's awesome. That is awesome support, number one. So a shout-out to the fans, uh, whether it was students. I'm going to imagine it was a lot of students probably. I think they had a, a like a $15 excursion deal. It was a pretty good deal. But that's awesome to be able to get that because, man, you go up to your rival, having just any little bit like that is, is a huge help. Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, it's fun for one. I mean, that arena is a fun place to go into and win. And, and uh, yeah, I'm, the fans to be a part of it, that's – that's a big deal. Four busloads. That's incredible. 
Ah, Maryland's up next for the women, according to Tim, too. So that's a gigantic game right there. there there's your one of the best teams. I think Maryland's a top-rated uh, women's team in the Big Ten right now. So uh, And Indiana's had a little taste of it before. I think – I can't remember if they – I think they lost to them already. I can't remember. Yeah, they did. They did. Um, so, yeah, so there's a little shot for revenge, but also – to hang, they, they still they're hanging around, man. They're at the they're up there. They're within a game and a half of the lead. So uh, winning is winning, and and we'll keep you up there. That's all that matters. Yeah, and they've got um, you know they've got a good opportunity. This this Maryland game, if they could get this one back, would be a big deal. I mean, I know they lost at Maryland, but this game could give them uh, you know a split with the team that's probably considered the best in the Big Ten on the women's side, and and. You know, it, it, it's a it's a huge game all the way around for him. Tim also said that Dayu fans were louder than Purdue's and Mackey. <laughs> <laughs> Was Tim on the buses? I, know, I doubt it because he's down in New Albany. I doubt he went up there. I would highly doubt it. But uh, congratulations to him, and I hope they had a good time. Hey, man, did you watch? Uh, we didn't talk about the, any Super Bowl commercials yesterday. Did you, did, did you watch? See any of them? Any of them stand out? Did you see anything? You know. Um... I'm probably one of the few people. Well, that's probably not true. I, that, I just am not a big Super Bowl commercial kind of sewer. Um, I mean, I, I think they're some of them are interesting. Um, it was kind of funny seeing the MC Hammer come back. Although I think he'll probably do anything for money. Yeah, who these would days. <laughs> the, the two, uh, I, I didn't really even see him either, like you. But I, I kind of went back and watched just a couple, just to go back. Actually, to, I, I just googled what was the top ten. Uh, and two that really stood out, and probably number one was the Groundhog Day with the Jeep commercial. Yeah, that was with good. Bill Murray. That was good. Of course, you got Bill Murray. You, you, you're winning. I mean, uh, he's just funny. So he, but the, yeah, that was a good commercial. And then the Mountain Dew commercial that they did the spoof on uh, <clears throat> the Shining. So that and that was kind of cool. And they had the Mountain Dew rolling out from the elevators instead of the blood, and Mountain Dew spelled backwards on the door instead of murder. And then uh, Brian Cranston turns into the twins. Yeah, it I was kind of weird, man. It was one. funny. It was kind of funny. Uh, but that's it, yeah, that's about it. And then they had the Brady spot because there was all of that that, that talk about that that uh, Twitter. A tweet he sent out when he was walking out of Foxborough last week. Well, all that was was a teaser for a commercial that he was doing for Hulu. Yeah, it's something to do. And I saw the end of it, I think, where he said, I'm not going anywhere or something like that. I think that's all I saw of that, which was plenty. Yeah, well enough. <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, and then the Super Bowl halftime show. Man, I knew I, I had no interest. Uh, I, I was at a friend's, Kylie had a soccer tournament over the weekend. They finished second in, uh, down in Louisville. And I went down to watch and, and then also Sunday I was coming back to uh, buddies that had a Super Bowl party. So stopped for the first half, uh, at Mark's and, uh, enjoyed that. But I'm like, I have no interest in watching this halftime show. So that's what I was going to leave to go home. And that's when I left. And, uh, I, but I watched a replay of the beginning of it and I'm like, nope. And I'm like, none uh, to me, it was the worst. First, I, I've never. No one else. I've never watched a. I've never watched a halftime show. Uh, I mean, I, I shouldn't say that. I've watched like bits and pieces of them. I've, I've never really seen any kind. Of, I don't understand why they try to squeeze something into that. Because I, I, if you're there to watch a football game, or if you're watching a football, and I get it. I'm not trying to be Scrooge on the deal. Like it's the biggest event in the world. I I, I understand. I get it. But. But I mean, I just don't understand why you try to squeeze a concert or whatever into the middle of something like that. I can I can proudly announce I did not watch. I didn't even glare at the screen for one second during anything to do with halftime. Um, so I mean, I had stuff to do around the house, and I was I was did all my stuff around the house and fixed some uh, some snacks and stuff like that. And I can honestly say I did not see one second of it. Look at you being efficient. Pretty proud. I was pretty proud of it. Being efficient, man. Being efficient. I even missed the first drive of the second half. That's how. That's how into it I was. Gonna be getting, getting my chores a, done. Being a good house husband. Domesticated is what I am. Oh, good for you. That's an awfully good job. <laughs> <laughs> I was awfully proud of you. Hey, I did. I did. I tell you, Dustin Shooty's on the program today from uh, Saturday Tradition. We're going to talk about the Big Ten transfer proposal uh, that's out there. 
Uh, Dustin Schutte, of course, from Saturday Tradition. Also, this you know college football signing day is tomorrow. So uh, we'll talk to him a little bit about that as well. But, uh, Todd, uh, you know, th- there's – right now – you, there's so much talk with people transfer because who's going to be immediately eligible and who's not. And it seems so ar- arbitrary right? Uh, that th- there are no rules. Like what are the rules here, man? And the, the, so there are no sets of rules, but, and the big 10 has proposed a for, for the big 10 only uh, right now, but a one-time transfer that you can just transfer wherever you want and you're immediately eligible. But did you know that it's a that is already that way in every sport except for the five uh, so called big sports? No, I didn't. I, I didn't I, either. I didn't know that was the case. But I, I also like I don't understand what that means because if it if it's only the Big Ten talking about doing it, so then do you have to transfer within the Big Ten or does is it someone transferring into the Big Ten? Or is you know it, what? Is if, a, if I'm transferring from the Big Ten to the ACC. I well, think the Big don't... Ten has proposed it. Um, how does that? How do you, it's a good question. How does it work? Um, but I mean, so... I, I don't. I don't particularly love it in either in any way um, because I think that there, you know, there is right now. If you want to transfer out, and it's a, um, you know, it's important to you, and and you really feel like you've made the wrong decision. One, you know, you kind of have that first year to to assess the situation. And, and I think we've all probably been in situations before where, you know, a week into it, you're thinking, Oh my gosh, this is, I don't know if I can do this anymore. It's the worst mistake I ever made. And two months later, you, you kind of love it. And, you know, I think that's kind of one of the life lesson things there is with it. If you could just willy nilly transfer wherever you want to, but you can only do it once. You can only do it once. but, But then after that, you can still transfer the year and sit out. I'm yeah, assuming. but you can, know. but you're going to lose a year and all that. I mean, because see, here's the thing: the coaches can move around as uh, whatever they want without any kind of penalty. I have always said, I have always, and I will always say, if there's a coaching change, you should you should have the freedom to transfer no matter what. And I I don't see why that would. But if you pick a school based on you know everything that goes with it, the school, their history, their coaching staff, everything that that you should make your decision based on and none of that changes. I think that there should be some penalty for you transferring and sitting out a year. I don't think is that big of a deal. I mean, I really don't. I, 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 but I could also play the flip side of it. I mean, kids, you can, you can know that you've made a wrong decision. You know, the, the school, what if the schools were allowed to do that? What if the schools were allowed to say, you know what? We, we don't think that you're going to work out the way that, they have been able to. They 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 went. The scholarships are only one year renewable. Your scholarship uh, you, was only good for a year. Have you ever really seen a situation where a school didn't renew somebody's scholarship? Yes. I, I mean, maybe it, it happens. It, it, it does happen. That's how. It. That's how they would get rid of players. Name Absolutely. One. That's I'm with but you. Indiana. I'm with you. But one. Indiana was. Uh, but on that same deal, Indiana was one of the schools. They do not allow that. They made their own rule before anybody that uh, scholarships were guaranteed. And I get that. I'm saying, like, the, I know that I know that they're one year deals because we had to sign a document every year. Well, they're not they, anymore at Indiana. Is what I'm saying. But even when it was, like, I've never heard of a school not honoring its scholarships. Right. It, 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 um, sadly, it happened. Sadly, it happened. Uh, Michigan Athletic Director Ward Manuel said, we have five sports that are not allowed to transfer in this day and age. That is something that we need to fix. We need to give all young people flexibility to transfer once. If they transfer a second time, there is no waiver. So um, I, I think most of the coaches are behind it. Jim Harbaugh is behind it. I know I, I remember hearing him talk about that very thing back at the uh, football, Big Ten football media days well, last summer. So I, I think all the coaches are behind it because there, there's so much talk in this day and age too, you know, about the players getting paid and this and that. And and so I think that they're trying to mitigate that in some way, hoping that that helps to mitigate it. Maybe I don't know, but uh, it, it's, I think it's coming regardless of whether we like it or not. That's really, and it's just a, it's just a change. It's going to be made. So we'll, we'll I think it's it. less of an impact on football than, than the other than basketball for sure, because, Less, less guys. I mean, we hear about the 
The yeah, one big, guy cannot make the impact in football that he star, can in basketball. Yeah. Big name five star guys we hear about when they transfer from someone, but think about all the linemen and and tight ends and guys that you know go somewhere and you know they don't even play their freshman year. Most of the time, guys redshirt. And when you're talking numbers wise, the big time five stars we don't think about that. But a lot of the guys who go there and and you know we don't know about. I mean, they redshirt their freshman year, and and that would be the year they could make that decision to leave. Good morning, Alan and Birdseye. You're listening to Indiana Sports Beat with Coy O'Leary. We've got a lot more coming up here on this Tuesday. Joining us next, Dustin Schutte from the Saturday Tradition. We're back with that and more. The Golf Club Eagle Point Studios right after this. everybody, Jim Coyle from Indiana Sports Beat. When I'm not covering the Hoosiers, you can find me at Bubba's 33 in Clarksville, located on the northeast corner of I-65 at Veterans Parkway. Bubba's 33 has hand-tossed pizzas, bold burgers, and ice-cold beer from a select list of local craft brewers. An incredible food selection, all made fresh daily. Whether you're meeting the team for that post-win meal in the family dining area or meeting friends for happy hour to watch the game on one of Bubba's 50 TVs, Bubba's 33 in Clarksville. Pizza, burgers, beer. We all want a winning smile for those championship photos, and that's exactly what you will get at Reynolds Family Dentistry in Sellersburg. Reynolds Family Dentistry has been serving the dental needs of Hoosier families for over 30 years. Let Dr. Roger and Jay Reynolds take care of your family. Just off of I-65 at 809 South Indiana Avenue in Sellersburg. Call 812-246-3368. That's Reynolds Family Dentistry, 812-246-3368. I'm Rain Shaddy, and I'm a Hoosier. As a toddler, you could always find me running around in a cream and crimson onesie and a red IU hat reminiscent of those worn during the world-famous William Tell timeout, shouting, Go Hoosiers! Like many other alum, I chose to make Bloomington my home. As a civic and alumni leader, I have become very knowledgeable about our community and would love to share my insights with you as your realtor. Find me on Facebook or call or text me, Ryan Shaddy, with FC Tucker Bloomington Realtors at 765-623-9093. Now that warm weather has arrived, it's time to hit the links, and there's no better place than the golf club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. Voted best golf course by the readers of the Bloomington Herald Times, the golf club at Eagle Point is under new ownership, has new fairways and bunkers, and it's open to the public. When the round's over, there's cold beer and a full menu at the Eagle Point Pub and Bistro. Call 812-824-1100 to make a tea time. That's 812-824-1100. The golf club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. This is AJ Moye. This is Dan Dockett. Hey, this is Michael Lewis. I'm an Indiana basketball player. This is Indiana football coach. Tom Allen. This is Jim Coyle with the Indiana Sports Beat. You can always like and follow us on Facebook. Always follow the show rebroadcast on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify. The DailyHoosier.com is a great place to sign up for each and every day. Or, of course, on 97.7 The Ref in Evansville. Bad theater seats, cheap Halloween masks, my apartment, all things with obstructed views. Add to these large trucks and buses. 18-wheelers and large buses have big blind spots, and like my apartment, they don't always have the best view. Bus and truck drivers deal with blind spots around the entire vehicle. Always take care not to ride alongside or too close behind them. Our roads, our safety. Learn more at sharetheroadsafely.gov. Hi, this is A.J. Moye, and you're listening to Indiana Sports Beat with Jim Coyle. Today's guest is brought to you by Reynolds Family Dentistry of Sellersburg. You need a million-dollar smile for those championship photos, and that's exactly what you'll get with Reynolds Family Dentistry. No, I will end my darling. You me so, darling. You me so, darling. Welcome back. Golf Club at Eagle Boys Studios, Indiana Sports Beat with Coyle Leary coming through here on this Tuesday. Jake rocking us out there a little bit. Like that. Joined now by our friend Dustin Schutte from Saturday Tradition. Dustin, how's it going? Hey, Jim. I'm doing good. Uh, before we get too deep into football here, uh, Saturday afternoon, the biggest game in Archie Miller's career, yes or no? Uh, this Saturday? <laughs> well, that's I did, You know what? I hadn't thought about it in, in that regard, but uh, I, I guess – you know, if he lost that, that would be a bad, 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 bad loss. 
Yeah, I'm yeah. thinking with uh, with this being the fourth straight, you need a little think, momentum, Todd? beating a rival at home, maybe get the Hoosiers back on track a little bit. Uh, but I'm sure there's uh, going to be plenty of grumbling if they don't uh, they don't get a win on Saturday. But Purdue's been terrible on the road, so I was gonna maybe say, they'll have be too much trouble. If that doesn't happen, I'm going to be honest with you. I, 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 I agree with you, Dustin. I mean, it's I mean, I'm not trying to to you know stir the pot on Archie. I I love Archie, and I'm million percent behind him, but. But from the standpoint of of all the outside noise, this would he still has yet to beat Purdue, and this is a I mean, forget the opponent, and and I, Jim and I talked about this all day yesterday. Like this is kind of a must win for Indiana if they're going to have the kind of season. I think I think they're still fully capable of having a great great season, and and playing you know getting on a roll and playing great. I think they've got the components to do it. They've just got to, to put it together and, and get things going in the right direction. And, and you know, I, I think this game, if they don't do it in this game, it'd be a four-game losing streak. It would be losing another one at home. And it's now, I mean, you're, you mentioned it, it's the rivalry game. And, yeah, I, I honestly, I hadn't thought about it that way, but I think you're right. I think it is probably the biggest game in Archie's career. Yeah, boy. So uh, I, I saw I saw that uh, you had put something up about the uh, Big Ten transfer proposal, and I planned on talking about that because normally Dustin comes on Thursdays with us, and I'm like, you know what? But just time, I'm just going to switch it up, and uh, that that could be that's a big big thing. We were just talking about that right before we went off on the last segment, uh, Dustin. But that would be a uh, an earth earth changing thing in, in the uh, college landscape. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about a, a massive rule change, and, and I think what the Big Ten has done a really good job of in the past is kind of seeing these trends in what college athletics, the way it's heading, and getting out in front of it. And I think that's what is happening here with the Big Ten. It sees that probably eventually, whether it's going to be five years or ten years, that we're going to have to switch the the formula here for transferring because what they have in place right now there's just no clarity. There's no transparency. There's no rhyme or reason behind anything of what the NCAA is ruling as well. What qualifies as immediately eligible and what qualifies as a, as a student having to sit out for a full season. So I think the big 10 saw the writing on the wall and wants to get this thing in motion and say, Hey, you know, the sooner we get this in place, the better uh, we won't have to deal with this kind of stuff anymore. So in my opinion, it's the right move for the big 10 because it's a great PR move. And you see, um, you know, this is the conference that, again, you look back to when Delaney started Big Ten Network, you know, uh, Jim Delaney got that ball rolling and now you have SEC Network and Longhorn Network and Pac-12 Network. And, you know, so the Big Ten is really good at getting out ahead of this stuff. And I think this was just another great move on their part. Well, to explain it, cause not, neither Todd or myself understand. How will it now? Is this something just the Big Ten is going to do for a year like they do a lot of things? Or is this something they are proposing to the NCAA to become uh, a rule? Well, my understanding is that this is the Big Ten's, uh, what, what they're proposing it to the NCAA to make this change. So the Big Ten is basically saying, you know, everybody or, or the majority of our conference believes that this is the right move to do. Now we're going to put it on the NCAA to start getting the ball rolling here. So I, I don't think that you would see a situation in which the Big Ten allowed it. Um, I don't know if that would be um, equal across all boards when you talk about other conferences, because then you're going to talk about players who are transferring well they're probably not going to transfer outside the conference at that point um so i think it would have to be across college athletics including every conference so i, I don't have as good of understanding as some of the other people that were reporting on it but i i do believe that basically the big 10 and and the member institutions thought at least the majority of them thought that this was the best way to go and now they want to propose this to the ncaa and say hey this is our one-time transfer proposal. Take a look at it, see what you think, and, and let's start getting the ball rolling on something like this. And there are good points to both sides, and Todd made some a minute ago. And, Todd, you, you were talking about that, and he is, being a college athlete, he has a different perspective. Uh, and what, what are you saying again? Well, I mean, here's – I hate to say I like it or don't like the proposal right off the bat. My, my initial instinct is to think I don't like it. Um, and, and here's like, I think that there should be when, when you make a decision to go somewhere, you base it on a bunch of different things. And that would include the coaching staff. It would include the school itself and, you know, the scheduling and the conference they're in all, just a bunch of different things factor into where you're going to go to school. And, and, you know, if you, if they make the, the change where you, you know, you can, you can just willy nilly transfer wherever you want for no rhyme or reason at the end of a year. 
I mean, I, I don't really support that without there being, you know, a penalty for you transferring. And I don't, I don't understand why that that is such a big deal when they talk about flexibility for that, because what happens if you transfer, if you do that at the end of a year and you transfer and you go to whatever school it would be, I'm assuming you're going to make those same choices on the new school that you go to because of a coaching staff and a system and what it is. What happens if after your second year of being at that school, the whole coaching staff changes and that that guy gets a job at a bigger, better place and everybody moves on and they bring in somebody else that runs a completely different system. Well, then, you know, you're pretty much locked in to, you know, having, you, you kind of have to stay there. Well, I I think there should always be, I, I don't like the fact that it locks you in at that point to where after that, you definitely have the penalties. You have to sit out or whatever. I would like it much better if a kid transferred or went to a school and this coach left, he would have the freedom to leave and go to another school. And if the coach from that school leaves, he has the freedom to leave and go to another school. Because I think you select it more for, as a player, you select it. The, the biggest you know, criteria you look at is the coaching staff and their system that they run. And if that changes, I think you should have total freedom to leave. I don't care if it's four years in a row. Yeah, and I think that you bring up some good points. And this is something that even Pat Fitzgerald has talked about. You know, uh, he doesn't – he talked about the same thing you kind of talked about. You know, you need a a year to get kind of adjusted to the new – whether it's the coaching staff, the school, the academics, whatever that case might be. I think the biggest concern, and on my end, and I don't disagree with you, I think that the sit, uh, sitting out for one season, I don't know that that's necessarily the worst thing in the world for a student sure, athlete, I although agree, I know yeah. it can't eat up a year of your eligibility, so I'd like to see that maybe eliminated. But I think the part that is frustrating is the fact that there's no consistency on what is considered a one, what, what's considered um, eligible for immediate participation and what's not. I mean, I, I used the example in the story that I wrote uh, between uh, Justin Fields, quarterback at Georgia, and Luke Ford, the tight end at Georgia. Um, you know, this is a kid, Luke Ford, who transfers closer to his hometown to be close to uh, family members who are in ill health, um, wants to play at Illinois um, so he can be closer to his family. Um, he doesn't get an immediate eligibility waiver. Then you have Justin Fields, who I know that there were um, some, some derogatory um, words thrown his way during a, during a uh, game. Uh, last season in 2018, um, but he said, and, and Tom Mars said that his attorney said that that wasn't a factor. Well, he's transferring. Fr- he's from Kennesaw, Georgia. He transfers farther away from his hometown, and he gets an immediate eligibility waiver. There's no coaching change there, so it, it really makes no sense. So I think what they're trying to do is say, hey, whatever the system is, we need it to be consistent. So whether that's we're going to allow immediate eligibility for everyone or we're going to have a one year sit out rule for everyone. Um, I think it needs to be consistent and there should be no, there should be no loopholes regardless of what it is. And when you talk about, I think coaching changes, as you mentioned, if a kid, well, uh, if his coach leaves position coach, head coach, whatever the case might be, that is so frequent anymore. You know, his position coach may be not be the same guy as the, as is the guy who was recruiting him and convinced him to come to that school. Right. So there's, there's so many loopholes. I think that, you almost have to have some sort of consistent rule just to make sure that everybody's on an equal playing field. Yeah, because otherwise it's going to be held up to subjectivity each and every time. And as you just mentioned, numerous examples that it's just sometimes you're just shaking your head like, what the hell are they thinking? Well, and- yeah, it, it, that is, I mean, that is, I, I think Michigan State's basketball program is a big example of this right now. And, what, and you know, what a difference you would that how- make in that team right now, Todd? Yeah, and what, what how would it change their season? It would be – it's the diff- – I mean, the Langford kid being injured, that's that's obviously something you can't – you know, you can't affect. Right, it. But, right, but right, the right. Hauser kid transferring from Marquette would be an unbelievable impact on their team. And I do believe they probably would be the number one team in the country if they had another scorer like him. And, and I think Izzo, without question – I mean, obviously him stepping down from his position on that committee – I think proves the fact of, you know, he's as frustrated with it. And that's a coach that's on the committee is as frustrated with the situation of it's just unfair because you can never, there's a black and white, there's a gray area, however you want to look at it. Like there is no consistency to how how they do this. And then, you know, it's, it's frustrating beyond belief. 
And Dustin, something a lot of people didn't realize, and I'm one of those, Todd was one of those, this is already allowed in every sport in the NCAA, except for men's and women's basketball, football, baseball, and soccer. In every other sport, you could already do this. Yeah, and and that's, you know, the money, uh, the, the revenue-generating sports are the ones that are, are getting hamstrung there a little bit. And and uh, I think that, again, you look at it, you just want equality across all sports. And whether that's every athlete needs to set out for one season or every athlete gets immediate eligibility, I think they're just looking for some consistency. And, you know, to be quite honest, when we talk about this from a from a football perspective – I don't know that it changes much in the in terms of football. I'm sure there's going to be I'm sure I'll be proved wrong if this goes into place in three or four years, um, just like the the four game redshirt rule kind of changed everything. But when you talk about this affecting, like I think the biggest effect would be college basketball because there's almost a way where if you're a really good basketball player, you can almost be plugged in just about anywhere and you can be effective. If you're talking about football, there, there's a lot more detail there. Um, you have a lot more guys who are coming in who are, who are more talented, more college ready now. You have different schemes. You have different positions. I mean, look at Tate Martell. He was a four-star quarterback who many thought would win the starting job at Ohio State, potentially over Dwayne Haskins. He goes down to Miami. He can't get on the field at quarterback. He has to make a position change to wide receiver. So there's a lot more to it in football. There's a lot more aspects of it that I think it may not change quite as much the football landscape, but I think when you talk about basketball and the kind of impact that really good players can have immediately, you know, somebody used the example, well, what if there's a season when, um, you know, Kansas may be, may not have a a star point guard. Well, maybe they can just go out, recruit another team, uh, another team's point guard, and uh, he can immediately make an impact. I don't know that you see that that as much in football, but you know, you could, you could definitely understand where there would be, um, some of the, the rich getting richer there in college basketball. And, and we all know the scandal that surrounds Bill Self and Kansas basketball this season. So they're kind of the, the uh, glutton there for punishment on, on that front. Yeah, but, you know, let me, let me, let me say this, because this, this is why my opinion is what it is. And I'm fully confident in making this statement that I'm going to say is, you know, when, when I played, and this is back in the 90s, so obviously a long, long time ago, but it was kind of a hard rule that, you know, if you transferred, you had to sit out a year. And and mm-hmm. that detoured a lot of people from transferring. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to name any names, but you can go back and look at the names on the rosters that I played on. And I will tell you, there is a really, really good chance that if there was no sit-out rule, if you did not have to sit a year out and you could immediately be eligible, there are a lot of players that were on my team that would have transferred. And I'm talking big name players, players that started every game of their careers. And, and I'm fully confident in making that statement. And so that rule kept them within the program. It kept it all. It kind of held, I want to say it kind of held all of college basketball together because nobody wants to sit out that year. That year is a difficult, like that makes a big a big difference in your decision, whether you want to leave or not. And I think it would open up. I think the floodgates would be, people would be shocked once they saw how much kids transferred, if they had no, no ramifications for leaving one time and going to another school. I think a lot of programs would suffer from that because if a kid wasn't happy with anything or just saw something a little bit, I mean, I, I think, I think cheating is a bad, a bad thing that happens in, in college basketball. I think it would be so much worse if you could go entice a kid like what you're talking about, if it, if a team needs a point guard, you know, rather than go recruit some high school kid, I'm not sure what he's going to be like. I'll go entice some kid that I know I've already seen what he can do. And maybe he just wants a different landscape of things. Maybe he just wants a different atmosphere for a year or so. And, and I, I think it would open up the floodgates and just be horrible, but people would be shocked if they would have known how many Indiana players that I played with would have left. Yeah, I think there would have been a lot of that that people would have been surprised. But and that uh, one year kept that one year kept everybody together because nobody wants to sit out that year. Right on. Well, it's uh, definitely a, a new age, and uh, probably a, we're going to be seeing it coming soon. But we'll certainly find out. Dustin, tomorrow also college football signing day, man. It's a big day tomorrow. Yeah, I know. I've got to get up early, so I'm going to have to have extra coffee uh, in, in the coffee pot tomorrow morning. But it's a uh, Signing day part two. I always consider it now. We, we just got done talking about transferring. Consider it part two of three because then after uh, spring practice concludes, then you usually get the transfer portal stuff. 
Um, and so then there's, you know, there's really like a third signing day um, with, with all those recruits and, and, you know, the depth chart kind of getting set, but it should be really fun. I know from the Indiana perspective, this wasn't maybe quite the recruiting class that you'd hoped for after an eight win season, but um, it is nice to see that, you know, Indiana did get a head start. Um, one of the top prospects there from Indiana in the 2021 class um, I saw has committed. So, you know, that's a good thing for the Hoosiers and uh, you know, we'll see what happens. There's, there could be some signing day uh, surprises. I know the Hoosiers still have, I think three guys right now, um, who are still yet to sign, and, and we'll see if they ink on the dotted line tomorrow or if uh, there's a change of heart or if maybe Tom Allen can get a last-second surprise and move up the recruiting rankings there tomorrow afternoon. It does beg the question, though, that uh, after having a successful season, why did the recruiting wane a little bit? Because uh, the two previous classes, uh, two of the better possibly ever in the school history, uh, on the backs of losing seasons, not making a bowl, just on the passion of Tom Allen. Uh, but this, yeah, this was not, they didn't, they didn't really uh, benefit from their season, from their bowl appearance. This is not the, uh, they didn't get that boost. Yeah. And I think you can account it to really two things. One, you know, is that, they had to recruit very specifically. Um, when Tom Allen was first there, he was just trying to get guys in that he thought could contribute pretty early in their career. And now he's got to go and, and get guys, you know, on the offensive line, he's got to get um, specific position groups. So I think that factors into it a little bit. I think the second part of that is now you're starting to recruit kids, teams, you know, across the country, starting to recruit kids a little earlier. So when you talk about this class, the, the 2020 class, basically what it had seen from Indiana was a pair of five and seven seasons and no bowl eligibility and two losses to Purdue. So I think now what Tom Allen can use for that eight and five is that 2021 class, um, because all a lot of kids have already committed. Um, obviously, there's a lot of kids that, that are out there that, that have not committed by the time the season's over. But at the same time, th there are a lot of kids who have their mind made up. They've limited down to their top three, top five, top ten, whatever it might be. And Indiana may not have been in that conversation after back-to-back -back five and seven seasons. Now I think Tom Allen goes on the road. He, he played the Gator Bowl down there in, in Jacksonville, which is a hot recruiting spot for them down there in Florida. Um, you get an eight and five season. You beat Purdue. You go on the road and you beat Nebraska. Uh, and now you, you're poised, you get ranked in the uh, top 25 for the first time in 25 years. And now you're poised to say, hey, we can get back to back bowl seasons here. And I think that's where Tom Allen can capitalize. I think, like I said, you know, the number five, number six player in the state of Indiana has already committed. Um, and that's a pretty early commitment for the Hoosiers. So I think that they can take advantage of that eight and five season with the 2021 class. It, it, Any more with the way recruiting works and, and working so far in advance you don't usually see the, re the uh, results on the recruiting until the year after you have that kind of success on the field. Absolutely. I cannot thank you enough, Dustin. We appreciate it. We look forward to all the happenings tomorrow. Make sure you uh, keep up with it on uh, Saturday Tradition. We'll be looking forward to a big, big signing day. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. And uh, appreciate you, Jim and, and Todd, for having me on. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens on Saturday, right? Everybody in the state of Indiana is going to be ready for that one. Yeah, absolutely, brother. We yeah, absolutely appreciate you. Have a great day. Hey, thanks, guys. There's Dustin Shitty from Saturday Tradition joining us here from the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios in Indiana Sports Beat with Coyle Leary. He's back with more right after this. Hello, everybody. Jim Coyle from Indiana Sports Beat. When I'm not covering the Hoosiers, you can find me at Bubba's 33 in Clarksville. Located on the northeast corner of I-65 at Veterans Parkway, Bubba's 33 has hand-tossed pizzas, bold burgers, and ice-cold beer from a select list of local craft brewers. An incredible food selection, all made fresh daily. Whether you're meeting the team for that post-win meal in the family dining area or meeting friends for happy hour to watch the game on one of Bubba's 50 TVs, Bubba's 33 in Clarksville. Pizza, burgers, beer. We all want a winning smile for those championship photos, and that's exactly what you will get at Reynolds Family Dentistry in Sellersburg. Reynolds Family Dentistry has been serving the dental needs of Hoosier families for over 30 years. Let Drs. Roger and Jay Reynolds take care of your family. Just off of I-65 at 809 South Indiana Avenue in Sellersburg. Call 812-246-3368. That's Reynolds Family Dentistry, 812-246-3368. I'm Rain Shaddy, and I'm a Hoosier. 
As a toddler, you could always find me running around in a cream and crimson onesie and a red eye U hat reminiscent of those worn during the world famous William Tell timeout, shouting, Go Hoosiers! Like many other alum, I chose to make Bloomington my home. As a civic and alumni leader, I have become very knowledgeable about our community and would love to share my insights with you as your realtor. Find me on Facebook or call or text me, Ryan Shaddy, with FC Tucker Bloomington Realtors at 765 623 9093. Now that warm weather has arrived, it's time to hit the links, and there's no better place than the golf club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. Voted best golf course by the readers of the Bloomington Herald Times, the golf club at Eagle Point is under new ownership, has new fairways and bunkers, and it's open to the public. When the round's over, there's cold beer and a full menu at the Eagle Point Club and Bistro. Call 812-824-1100 to make a tea time. That's 812-824-1100. The golf club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. This is AJ Moyer. This is Dan Docker. Hey, this is Michael Lewis, former Indiana basketball player. This is Indiana football coach. Tom Allen. This is Jim Coyle with the Indiana Sports Beat. You can always like and follow us on Facebook. Always follow the show rebroadcast on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify. The DailyHoosier.com is a great place to sign up for each and every day. Or, of course, on 97.7 The Ref in Evansville. Bad theater seats, cheap Halloween masks, my apartment, all things with obstructed views. Add to these large trucks and buses. 18 wheelers and large buses have big blind spots, and like my apartment, they don't always have the best view. Bus and truck drivers deal with blind spots around the entire vehicle. Always take care not to ride alongside or too close behind them. Our roads, our safety. Learn more at sharetheroadsafely.gov. This is former Indiana basketball player Greg Green. Keep up with the Hoosiers on Indiana Sports Beat with Jim Coyle. This segment is brought to you by Bubba's 33 in Clarksville. Pizza, burgers, beer. I think as you look at the game, it's, it's mental right now for us. You know, it's mental over the physical. You're at that tough stretch of the season where things are hard and you're trying to finish the race. And, you know, you still got a little bit to go here, but um, you have to find that second win. And I think that was, you know, telling of our team this week that we played the game uh, much more of a clouded mind, a heavy head. Than rather than heavy feet and, and whatnot. And that happens. You know, sometimes you lose a tough game at home and, you know, whether you're a little bit down or whatnot, I mean, you have to find a way to really respond. And I felt like at times in the Penn State game, our defense was even good enough to really be hanging in a lot longer in that game. Our offense wasn't good enough at all, the way we shot the ball and, and turned it over. And then, uh, you know, our offense wasn't very good um, early in the Ohio State game, but, you know, defensively they missed shots and, and we had our opportunities and then we started to score. You know, in the second half, we started to right. score the ball, but we couldn't, we couldn't stop them from, from doing what they wanted to do. And we just weren't a physical team last week. Um, and sometimes when you're not a physical team, you know, a lot of things can start to be taken advantage of you. you know, you're... There's Coach, Coach Archie Miller, Indiana basketball coach, talking about uh, his team's current woes, Todd, and uh, they certainly are in the midst of a – a funk, I guess you could say. Yeah, you know, it's interesting to hear his to hear the way he explains it about the mental side of it because, um, you know, when when I first arrived on campus in Bloomington, and remember we had a recruiting class of seven, which included Calvert Cheney and Lawrence Funderburk and Pat Graham, and just I mean there was just some big name, big time players there, and and we get there, and one of the very first things that Coach Knight you know, sat us down and talked about was, and, and the reason I bring this up is because he repeated it, you know, I don't want to say yearly. I want to say like several times a week throughout our entire careers was the mental is to the physical as four is to one. And when he first said that, we're like, oh, geez, here's some, some coach lingo BS that we've got to listen to for whatever. And, and then, and then what he really does is he goes out and he proves it in games and, and he puts you in situations and scenarios where, you know, it proves itself. And, and it really, I, I hate to say it, but it really is a factor. I mean, you go back and look at, you go back and look at coach Knight's 1987 championship team. And you look at the players that are on that roster. And, and I don't mean to take anything away from any of them there. I, I actually would take this as a compliment if someone said it about me. But, I mean, they had no business winning the national championship from a talent perspective. 
it was mental. Guys knew what they needed to do, and they were fully confident that they could perform and do the things that they were asked to do. And when you put all those pieces together, it really makes, I mean, it really makes a tough to beat team. And, and that's the mental side of it, understanding and believing what your role, knowing what your role is, believing what your role is and that you're capable of performing it. And that's why you can get a guy like me that can play against a guy like Jalen Rose, who's six foot eight with really long arms and, you know, because because I knew I had help defenders here and there. I knew where I needed to send him. I knew he couldn't dribble with his right. I mean, I knew all the little details, but it was the I, – I use it to this day. It, and I say I – know, I know what my kids – first time I said it to them, I know how they felt about it because that's the same way I felt about Coach Knight. The first time he ever said the mental is the physical is four is to one. And I truly believe it is that much more important. And, and until these guys get it in their heads of – understanding what the role is. There's several aspects of it. It's not just believing, okay, I can win. I can do it. It's not just that. It's understanding what you're supposed to do, how that benefits the team and going out and, and performing it to the absolute best of your ability and putting everybody in a good situation. It doesn't mean, you know, it's not like we're sitting here saying, Hey, this team's got to go out and make 15 three pointers. I don't think they're capable of doing that consistently, but I do know that they could sit there and, and come up with a game plan that they all could execute and do. And, and that mental side of it that he's bringing up, I'm glad that he's saying that because I do believe this team is physically talented enough to win games, I, to win a lot of the games they've already lost. Yeah, and I've, I've said this before. I don't know that it was the best game they played because they lost, but that Maryland game at home, even though they did lose, other than the last couple of minutes where they the gave it away, half, yeah. They played outstanding because they did the things that they need to do to win games. They sh- they hit shots. They took good shots. They hit good, they hit tough shots too. But they also played inside and, and they did everything well except for win the game. And they just gave it away at the end. But so yes, I I'm agreeing with you that they have the talent. They've shown that they have the talent, but they're not putting it together. And this is a a unique season to where. It doesn't take a whole lot more than than just that. Put it together. Just play as a team. Uh, an average team can almost get by pretty well yeah. this season playing as a team. You're totally I, – a, a, a bunch of guys that are mediocre talent that understand a game plan and understand a, a, you know an overall philosophy that they're trying to execute and go out and, and all work together to do it is, is a much better situation – for a coach and for a team and for everyone involved than having, you know, one guy that's insanely talented that, you know, we all know every time down the floor, we're supposed to give him the ball. And that just that, you know, I, I could put a scheme together right now to stop that defensively all day long. And, and it's the guys who, when you work together and, and, and you get things going together, that's why, that's why basketball, when it's played in its purest form and it's played, you know, with, I hate to say it, but it's played, you know, with screens and motion and help defense and things like that. Like to me, that's why I fell in love with it. That's why I love, I love the team aspect of that. And that basketball's kind of gotten away from that. And the NBA's ruined it a little bit. The NBA is all one-on-one stuff. And I think that is seeped into college basketball a little bit. And, and, you know, I, I think that, There'll be coaches, I think, last year. Look at look at Virginia's team last year. They were probably the most ex- prime example in today's world of a bunch of guys that were working together. I mean, Kyle Guy and Ty- Jerome were two guys that could come down the floor and shoot in the first five seconds of the shot clock every time and get a good shot, and it'd be a good shot. But they bought into the system. They believed they were trying to wear the other team down. They used 30 seconds on the shot clock as much as possible, and they still got off a good shot. And it, they knew their game plan. They knew – what they were good at and, and they executed it. And right now I, I, you know, this Indiana team, I think is they, they played, you mentioned that Maryland game. You hear coaches say all the time, you know, you got to play in basketball, you got to play 40 minutes, you know, in, in football, you got to play a full 60 minutes. And in that game for Indiana, they played 38 and a half good minutes. And it just, it wasn't enough. You've got to play 40 good minutes to beat a really good team. And that minute and a half, they did everything wrong you could possibly do, and and it cost them the game. And that's you know that's how important. That's the lesson you and I talked about in the after the game show. 
that's the lesson that they could still take away from that game and, and come away with it and have it positively impact their season. Because if they could come away from that and say, we've got to play a full 40 minutes, we can never have a lapse in judgment, even when we've got an eight-point lead with a minute and a half to go, seven-point lead or whatever it was. Like, that's a game you can't lose. I mean, you if you're mentally thinking in that game, I go back to the possession where they shot the early three-pointer. When if Rob Finnessy pushed the ball down the floor and threw it to Al Durham and he shot a three-pointer, you know, six seconds into the shot clock in the last two minutes of the game. And, you know, I think at the end of the game, we would have all loved to have had that last, you know, that 24 seconds taken off the clock. It would have, it would have affected things and how they, how they played out. Yeah, they just want to see uh, how they have liked to have seen it have play out is just look at their counterpart, Maryland, in that game who did not quit and who did everything right to win that game in the last minute. And since then, has that has that has propelled them to uh, a pretty good chunk of the season right now it, it, where it, they it's, are. It's given them an insane amount of confidence. It, it really has. You know, I, I, I kept saw in the interviews – or kept sawing, kept seeing the interviews with uh, um, Patrick Mahomes, and they kept saying, you know – how do you guys have the heart to, you know, how do you guys come back and do this? And he just kept saying, you know, we've got the heart. And and I hate statements like that because that means the other team doesn't have heart in your opinion. And, and I don't think that's what he means by that. I truly don't. But what I really wanted to hear him say, because I, I think I've, we, we witnessed this, was if you watch them, they had already proven to themselves that they could get behind and they could come back. I mean, they did it repeatedly over and over again. And I think what that that's at the end of the time, when someone asks you the question, you know, how did you guys not panic? How do you guys know? It's because we've done it before, because we know we're confident in ourselves. Like we're going to go on a run and we're going to score points and we're going to, you know, put points up on the board. And, and that's the answer that I would expect him to give. Like, like we've done it before. And that's what we gave Maryland. That's what IU gave Maryland in that game. They gave them that confidence and that experience to know, Hey, we can do it. And Maryland can be a very dangerous team. They hadn't been up to this point this season. But now, since they played Indiana and since they gained that, you know, freedom and ability, flexibility, ability to think that they can come back from anything, I think I think it'll propel their season to be a better season than it would have been. I couldn't uh, agree with you more. Uh, looking at the AP Top 25 that come out now, Todd, uh, Baylor's at the top of the uh, – the ranking, uh, the net rankings that came out, San Diego State, uh, undefeated, they're at the top, but it's uh, the same four teams, uh, whether you look at the AP poll, which is Baylor, Gonzaga, Kansas, and then San Diego State. Uh, then on the net rankings at San Diego State, Baylor, Gonzaga, Kansas. Uh, pretty much the same teams right there right now. It's probably going to change a little bit uh, when we get to the end of the season, the one one line, the two line, and all that. But the, these teams have pretty much stayed the same for most of the season. Baylor, Gonzaga, Kansas, San Diego State making its way up the rankings, getting the respect uh, by playing. You know, they, they don't play the schedule that a lot of these other teams play, but they're unbeaten. Uh, Louisville has only lost three games. Dayton has only lost two games. Duke, uh, seventh, uh, lost three games. Florida State has only lost three games, including once to Indiana. And then Maryland is in the top ten now at number nine. Uh, they were 17 and four. And then Villanova uh, rounds out the top ten. But uh, this is a lot of these teams at the top line. They've been they've been pretty consistent this year. Yeah, I mean, you you look at Baylor and Gonzaga to me are by far the best two teams in the country. I mean, they they are they have every aspect that you can need. Baylor just makes the game miserable. I think it's I think Baylor is one of those you know uh, kind of forty minutes of hell like Arkansas used to be. Like I think Baylor just makes it tough. Gonzaga is insanely talented. They have every position you could need. They got guys that can shoot it. That that both of those two teams can shoot the ball, which gives them decided advantages. I think over the rest of them, Kansas and, and the rest of those down there. I mean, the the next best team in my opinion is probably Dayton. I mean, San Diego State's good because they play a lot of defense and they're tough to score against. But I think Dayton, you've been saying this all year long. I mean, Dayton is a really, really good team, and I agree with you. They are a really, really good team that's got a really good player they build it around, and they play hard defense. That so, dude yeah, is I mean, crazy good, too. He is. He is. Oh, yeah. Obi Toppin. ridiculous. He's crazy. <laughs> he is, but, the, man. And, but so all those teams up there, I mean, they're the one thing that probably separates them from the Michigan States of the world and even the Indianas of the world, and I'm going to say the Marylands of the world, is the fact that all those teams can shoot the ball. And 
and they've got good they've got guys that consistently make shots from the outside and they're not just relying on pounding the ball inside the whole time and that's what's going to keep you know that's what I think will keep Michigan State out of out of being up there that's what will keep you know that that's why I think Iowa is such a dangerous team because Iowa's got plenty of guys that can shoot the ball and and it just is it those top teams are will probably. I mean, you'll see Kansas and Baylor play each other, so those will wear you know those will wean themselves out a little bit. But Baylor's got a decent chance of running itself all the way you know all the way through their Big Twelve conference of, of staying undefeated and or undefeated in the conference. Yeah, if you want to look for Indiana in the net rankings, you got to look all the way down to uh, fifty one. Uh, they were 52 last week, I think, but uh, they get, they're holding on right now. But uh, we got plenty more to talk about on the program today. Chronic Hoosier joins us in the next hour, and we got lots more to talk about. We're going to talk more about the AP, the uh, net rankings with Indiana. Who's the best player in the Big Ten? Is he the same player? Is he the best in the country? We'll talk about that as well. You're listening to Indiana Sports Beat with Coy O'Leary. It's Tuesday, February 4th. We're coming to you from the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios. Back right after this. Hello, everybody. Jim Coyle from Indiana Sports Speed. When I'm not covering the Hoosiers, you can find me at Bubba's 33 in Clarksville, located on the northeast corner of I-65 at Veterans Parkway. Bubba's 33 has hand-tossed pizzas, bold burgers, and ice-cold beer from a select list of local craft brewers. An incredible food selection, all made fresh daily. Whether you're meeting the team for that post-win meal in the family dining area or meeting friends for happy hour to watch the game on one of Bubba's 50 TVs, Bubba's 33 in Clarksville. Pizza, burgers, beer. We all want a winning smile for those championship photos, and that's exactly what you will get at Reynolds Family Dentistry in Sellersburg. Reynolds Family Dentistry has been serving the dental needs of Hoosier families for over 30 years. Let doctors Roger and Jay Reynolds take care of your family. Just off of I-65 at 809 South Indiana Avenue in Sellersburg. Call 812-246-3368. That's Reynolds Family Dentistry, 812-246-3368. I'm Rain Shaddy, and I'm a Hoosier. As a toddler, you could always find me running around in a cream and crimson onesie and a red IU hat reminiscent of those worn during the world-famous William Tell timeout, shouting, Go Hoosiers! Like many other alum, I chose to make Bloomington my home. As a civic and alumni leader, I have become very knowledgeable about our community and would love to share my insights with you as your realtor. Find me on Facebook or call or text me, Ryan Shaddy, with FC Tucker Bloomington Realtors at 765-623-9093. Now that warm weather has arrived, it's time to hit the links, and there's no better place than the golf club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. Voted best golf course by the readers of the Bloomington Herald Times, the golf club at Eagle Point is under new ownership, has new fairways and bunkers, and it's open to the public. When the round's over, there's cold beer and a full menu at the Eagle Point Club and Bistro. Call 812-824-1100 to make a tea time. That's 812-824-1100. The golf club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. This is AJ Moye. This is Dan Docker. Hey, this is Michael Lewis, former Indiana basketball player. This is Indiana football coach. Tom Allen. This is Jim Coyle with Indiana Sports Beat. You can always like and follow us on Facebook. Always follow the show rebroadcast on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify. The DailyHoosier.com is a great place to sign up for each and every day. Or, of course, on 97.7 The Ref in Evansville. Bad theater seats, cheap Halloween masks, my apartment, all things with obstructed views. Add to these large trucks and buses. 18-wheelers and large buses have big blind spots, and like my apartment, they don't always have the best view. Bus and truck drivers deal with blind spots around the entire vehicle. Always take care not to ride alongside or too close behind them. Our roads, our safety. Learn more at sharetheroadsafely.gov. Hey, it's Michael Lewis, former Indiana University player and current UCLA assistant basketball coach, and you're listening to Indiana Sports Beat. Back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios, Indiana Sports Beat with Coyle Larry here on this Tuesday. When we left you, we were talking about the net rankings. Uh, Indiana has dropped down to 51. What's just that's not a no problem except for 
You don't want to continue to drop. <laughs> You'd like to be going the other direction, Todd. Yeah, I mean, definitely. But, I mean, those, the net rankings, like, there's so many. There's the Ken Palm. There's the A people. I mean, there's so many different ways to rank these things. It's just some of it becomes a joke when it gets to that point. Yeah, uh, net rankings is just one of the tools they use that uh, right. look yeah. at. But what's coming out, I think, this week or next week, I believe, they just did it with the women. And I don't recall that they did this before, and maybe they did, but the NCAA comes out with the top 16. And it is, I, I think, the top 16 on how it would be if the tournament started tomorrow. So the, the first four seeds from exactly. all four. They do yeah. the four, basically the top four seed lines is what you're getting. Yeah, uh, I, I like that. I like that idea, and I like it, – It's kind of like, like the football. It's like the college football playoff yeah. poll. Yeah, it is. Uh, I don't recall – did they do this? Do you remember them doing this before? I don't. Nope, nope. I, I don't either. They just came out with the women's and uh, – You remember, they, remember in our interview with Clark last week when you had him on the show, I mean, he, he talked about this Saturday they're doing their, you know, their full field of 68. If the season ended this Saturday, you know, and they had to do the field this week, what their 68 would be. And he said they do that this weekend. So that'll be fun, something to look forward to and watch and see. And they don't just now, do the 16. Is that something they, they do, do the on field. TV? Uh, yeah, that's what he said. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. That's going to yeah. be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It is. I, yeah, I mean, it is, but it, we, I mean, we look, so we look for anything that's like that, though. We do. We crave it. It's so, if, if you look, if you really think about it, it's stupid, but we don't care. We don't care. We want it. Give it totally all to agree. us. It's totally so, agree. We're so dumb. It, 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 the, well, in the you know the part of that that is interesting, like like Clark, for example, like I just I know I know when we had him on here, like we we always tell our guests how great they are and all that. But I mean, Clark is absolutely the best, and he always comes up with some nugget of of why he, he doesn't just say this is what I love about Clark Kellogg. He doesn't just say okay, Indiana is going to be a nine seed because when if you just say that then, you know, in my opinion, like I can argue that they should be a seven seed and someone else can argue that they should be a 10 seed. And, and he just backs up why he puts someone in a certain position and very, very seldom do you, can you argue with it. I mean, it, it makes sense. And guys are, you know, teams are in certain positions for certain reasons. And he always finds those teams that, um, you know, the, the Loyola Illinois of last year and teams like that, that, you know, you don't think about and, – and I think last year he seeded them, you know, up at like a 7 or something like that when everyone else had them at a 10 or 11 or 12. And you're like – he puts thought into into him being in there, not just – he doesn't care. He went to Ohio State. He doesn't care that you're a blue blood program or a top five or six conference or whatever it is. He just – he seeds them based on how the team is playing. And, and that's what – you know, that's what we want this time of year right now. I mean – but the, the bad part for Indiana, by the time they do these, Indiana will have lost three games in a row already. I mean, I wouldn't see the Indiana very high. I mean, I, you and I were talking not long ago, and I had Indiana as high as a six seed. And they've not played to that level in the last week and a half. Not even close. Tebow wants to know, can San Diego State stay undefeated? I mean, in their conference, they can. They, they won't once the tournament gets here. But what it, what it will give them the opportunity to do is it will probably put them as a one seed, at worst a two seed. One twos are not really that much different. So it'll put them at a one, one seed probably and, and at worst a two seed. Um, and it'll give them the opportunity to get, you know, to the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight. And at that point, you know, can they beat three top ten teams? I don't think so. But – but they'll have the opportunity because I think they'll they'll get that one or two seed and they'll they'll be in the Sweet Sixteen, and and at that point you know you just got to win you got to win four more games and and you know anybody can go on that kind of run once you get there. Just win, baby. Yep. North Carolina uh, ten and twelve. T boy point T boy points out they may not even make the NIT if that continues. Yeah, I mean, and and you know, it, I look at it the same way as Indiana, like. If you could, if you could gracefully and not look like complete turds, turn down the NIT. Um, you know, as an Indiana fan, I'd rather them turn it down. As a North Carolina fan, I'm sure they would probably rather turn it down than go play in that. Like it's, it's just, you know, it's playing in the consolation tournament, and that's I've never, I've just never bought into that. They may get the option. 
Luca Garza, is he the best player in the country? I know he's the best player in the Big Ten. Yeah, I mean, it would be – There's the hard part is when you're saying nationally, um, you know, I mean, you've got guards that you – that how do you compare him to a guard and that stuff? Then when you're looking at it, are you saying he's going to be the best pro or are you saying he's the best college player? I mean, who I know affects, uh, I'd say, who affects I, I the game. Affects the, I think he does. In my opinion, he is the most valuable player on his team and, and it has the biggest role and impact on his team. And I, I think he's the best, most versatile player in all of college basketball. And, and the funny thing is, you know, he's going to get better. He's going to, you know, he's probably going to become a better shooter. And, and I would tell you this too. That can make him I a would, dangerous player. If the, I'm including the Wiseman guy from Memphis too, that is, ineligible to play for the rest of the year, just decided not to play anymore or whatever. It, I don't care if he was still playing. I would still say Luca Garza is the most versatile player. That guy can't score outside the lane. He's incredibly talented. He's like, you know, he's like Beasley a couple years ago from Duke. I mean, he's so talented. It's disgusting, but he's not that versatile. And I don't know that his game will translate to the NBA as well as a, like, who do you think wants Luca Garza right now in the NBA? What team do you think want, wants Luca Garza right now? All of them, Dallas Mavericks. Dallas Mavericks. <laughs> I mean, he is a, he is a young. He is version. the exact replacement of carbon copy. He is. He of really Dirk is. Dirk And they would have. Think how many of those guys. They. I mean, they've got a six foot seven version of Dirk Nowitzki right now, and they've got who's the guy they got from the Knicks? Oh, Kristaps Porzingis. Porzingis. They've got that guy. What's the young guy Doncic? Doncic. Oh, however God. you say his name. I mean, Doncic, yeah, they're dude, they're they're a, just a, they may be a, a piece six away. Six version of of uh, who's the guy you said? You're right. Uh, uh, no, Dirk Nowitzki. Dirk Nowitzki. Yeah, I mean, they're going to have a full team full of them. And, they may, and, I, but, and that may be the final piece in putting them back together. You put Luka Garza on that team, woo, man! I, I'd start watching the NBA again. Man, that would be fun. It would be well. He's got to have a good shot. I think he, man, he's really got to be leading for Player of the Year. But there's some good, there's some good players out there. There's good players in the Big Ten. Has man, can you think of a year where there's many bigs in the Big Ten? It's it's been a while, but I mean, I know it's probably it's happened many times. But there's a lot of quality talent right now in this league. There, there is. I mean, you you know, you look at I, I, the NBA. It's going to be an interesting thing to see what happens with. Um, the Green Mile at, at Illinois, and whether he gets drafted or not. I mean, he is—he's a freak of nature, and I mean that in a in a positive way. I hope that doesn't come across wrong, but I mean, he is—he's different. Like Shaquille O'Neal was different because there was a lot of seven foot guys. I played in high school with a seven foot guy. Shaquille was just bigger. I, they're the same height. I don't know how to explain it. He's just bigger, and this dude is just bigger than everybody else. And I don't know if the NBA, they don't really have a place for that right now. I mean, they don't, but I think they'll make a place for it because it's so unique and so different. But I mean, you look at him, you look, I mean, and here's a guy that, that, that people will overlook now because there's so many good big guys, but look at the Reuters guy from, from Wisconsin. I mean, that's as talented a big guy as most people see all season long. Indiana, or I mean, big 10 teams just continue to see a different one. Seems like every game, but, but yeah, you're right. I mean, the big guys in the big 10, I mean, Purdue with Travion Williams and, and harms and those two that, you know, that double headed monster they've got there. I mean, those guys, Williams scored 36 points or 38 points against Michigan. I mean, these guys can play it, it's, it's up and down the whole league. Jalen Smith from Maryland. I mean, it's crazy. And as good as Illinois is and is playing right now, uh, the new bracketology came out. They're a they're a seven seed. That is that is they're not getting any respect at all, and it that's the that's the one they're missing. That's where I would tell you Ohio that, State is an eight seed. Yeah, and, so, and I, Illinois is a seven. That, that makes explain no sense that. to me. Like, I'll, what's Michigan State? Um, I have see. I've not seen them yet. There, go to the Midwest. And I mean, Michigan State. Michigan State gets because of Tom Izzo. I understand that they're a three they're, seed. They're a three seed right now. Right. I mean, so I'm telling. That's a you, big difference, man. I'm telling you straight up today, right now, in my mind, there is no question about it. Illinois is a better team than Michigan State. No question about it. And 
that is uh, when you see rankings like that here's my here's just my opinion i don't know this is a fact but this is what i would say is they have seen snippets of illinois team play they've not watched all 20 20 plus games that illinois played this year and they're basing those those seedings off of tom izzo and cassius winston versus you know brad underwood and you know, who would you even say for, for Illinois? I mean, does Asan Mu or you know, the guard? I can't even remember the guard's name. But, I mean, who would you, who would you base Illinois? Illinois is a team. They're a good team. They're, they've got big guys. They've got guards. They've got shooters. They've got a great, you know, the, the Georgie guy that, that sets all the screens and doesn't take bad shots and still figures out a way to score 8 to 12 points and grabs 8 to 12 rebounds every game. I mean, they're they're a really good team. I mean, that's that's the kind of stuff when you look at it midway through the year, you're like, yeah, this it is BS because there's no way they're a seven seed. Indiana currently a ten seed. If Illinois is a seven seed, Indiana doesn't deserve to be in the tournament. And <laughs> and I think Indiana has by far played themselves into the tournament. Right well, they're now. right now listed as a ten seed. Um, I, I don't think it really matters where what what region they're listed in right now because that's kind of whatever but i think the seedings are legit i think they're accurate where they are i don't know if that's all that accurate but the, currently he's got them in the midwest which would have them playing in st louis which is not a bad deal uh, yeah location but, wise never never has ever factored into it in my opinion i don't whether i mean would you rather be a one seed in the midwest you know if you have two te- two good teams from an area you know, would you rather be the one seed in the Midwest or would you rather be a two seed, you know, and it all depends on who's in the bracket to me. I don't care right. where it is. It's who's right. in it. It's at about point, matchups. At that point, you want the high, here, here's what I'll say. You want the highest seed possible. And, and that gives you the best opportunity. One and two, probably the, the littlest difference between those two. But if you're talking three to seven, gigantic difference between, who you play as a three seed that that your your second game is a big difference if you're a seven seed versus a a three seed gigantic yep. difference we'll see indiana has a, a great opportunity this week to change that or not this week i shouldn't say because i forgot they've got a millennium between games again um i, I don't and i don't understand that what the see this is the screwiest schedule yeah. three three different at least at least three if not four i'd have to go back and look but i know for a fact now three three times they've had an entire week between games that yeah. just seems like a lot i mean i know it's maybe it's good for rest but are you really not getting rest uh when you're practicing that much more i don't know but i, it yeah. just I, don't I know like they it. can't they can't plan it too much ahead of time but but i mean if your team's coming off of a three-game winning streak, that week is a lot different than if your team's coming off a three-game losing streak. And and I know Indiana put themselves in that position. But but I mean they're they're gonna go, so they're gonna play on Saturday, and then they don't play again until when? Like next Thursday. Thursday, yeah. The after that. Thursday. So so I mean you're talking it, it's gonna be two games over it's almost like a 14 day stretch. And so it's almost two straight weeks off. And and, and Coach Knight's math. You know, this is what he used to this is what he used to say to us all the time. So if we would start practice on a Saturday, we would start practice at noon and be done by three. If we didn't practice until three the next day, he's telling us he gives us a day off. Because it's twenty four hours before we practice again. <laughs> <laughs> That's his gorilla math that he used for us. But I mean that you know, this team didn't this is bad timing for them. They didn't need they didn't need this much time in between all this. Now if they come out and play great and, and you know, the practice time paid off and they win these two next home games and then go on, the you know, four out of five on the road and do well in that scenario, then, you know, we'll all look at it different. But so far, I mean, time has shown they had a big stretch off before they played Arkansas and, and it didn't turn out that well. And, and so it's just, it had a big, they had a lot of time off before they played Nebraska at home and they won the game, but it didn't, it didn't even play that great. And so time, you know, history has shown us that this team is after a week off has not come out and, you know, lit it on fire. 
You talked about uh, Baylor. We were talking about Baylor a little bit earlier. Uh, There's no Big Ten games last night, but there were some good games. Baylor and Kansas State. Uh, Kansas State gave Baylor all they wanted. Uh, Baylor, the, the Bears would win that one, seventy three sixty seven. But it was a it was a tight game. Yeah, I mean, Baylor is one of those teams that um, Kansas State is a tough place to play. I mean, West Virginia went in there and, and, you know, West Virginia was ranked in the top 15 and went to Kansas State and got beat by, you know, 15 or 20. I mean, it's a tough place to play. And, um, you know, Baylor controlled that whole game. If you watch the game, you know, they were they were ahead by it was kind of like Ohio State versus Indiana last weekend where. You know, in, even when Indiana was only down by eight or nine, I really never felt like they were getting ready to make a run and, and have any control of the game at all. I thought Ohio State controlled everything to do in that game, and, and Baylor controlled the whole game last night with Kansas State. And that is, that's an impressive thing to do when you're on the road. I don't really care where it is, but I know Kansas State's a pretty tough place to play. And, and believe me, I mean, Baylor is – they're good. Like, they are – they've got good shooters – They've got a couple of good big guys. They've got some guys they can bring in off the bench and pound with you a little bit. And their defense is – it's kind of like that 40 minutes of hell Arkansas used to run years ago. And and they make it tough on you for the whole 40 minutes. And they got guys – they're one of those teams that plays, you know, 10, 11 guys. And, and they've got the players to bring in and do it. And that's because – they're pressing and playing so hard and doing all that stuff. And, and I mean, they need to play 10 or 11 guys. A team like Indiana doesn't. They need to play seven. Kansas uh, continues to win. They beat Texas 69-58. They were not affected at all by by those suspensions, no. man. No. And, and they're, you know, Kansas, they're not an impressive team, in my opinion. Like, they're, they're okay, and they'll be, you know, they'll be fine. But Baylor will destroy them. And they'll they'll get knocked down in the rankings. They'll end up in the rankings. They'll end up like a three seed, three or four seed. Florida get- State enjoying a historic season for them, man. Even though Indiana beat them once this year, but they beat North Carolina at home last night, sixty five fifty nine. They're number eight in the country right now. Hey, Aurora, every, man. every win they get, it just helps Indiana's net net rankings. You bet you, you <laughs> bet. Hey, we got plenty more coming up here on Indiana Sports Beat. We're coming to you from the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios. Up next, Chronic Hoosier on the program. Stay tuned. We're back with that right after this. Hello, everybody. Jim Coyle from Indiana Sports Beat. When I'm not covering the Hoosiers, you can find me at Bubba's 33 in Clarksville, Located on the northeast corner of I-65 at Veterans Parkway, Bubba's 33 has hand-tossed pizzas, bold burgers, and ice-cold beer from a select list of local craft brewers. An incredible food selection, all made fresh daily. Whether you're meeting the team for that post-win meal in the family dining area or meeting friends for happy hour to watch the game on one of Bubba's 50 TVs, Bubba's 33 in Clarksville. Pizza, burgers, beer. We all want a winning smile for those championship photos, and that's exactly what you will get at Reynolds Family Dentistry in Sellersburg. Reynolds Family Dentistry has been serving the dental needs of Hoosier families for over 30 years. Let doctors Roger and Jay Reynolds take care of your family. Just off of I-65 at 809 South Indiana Avenue in Sellersburg. Call 812-246-3368. That's Reynolds Family Dentistry, 812-246-3368. I'm Rain Shaddy, and I'm a Hoosier. As a toddler, you could always find me running around in a cream and crimson onesie and a red IU hat reminiscent of those worn during the world-famous William Tell timeout, shouting, Go Hoosiers! Like many other alum, I chose to make Bloomington my home. As a civic and alumni leader, I have become very knowledgeable about our community and would love to share my insights with you as your realtor. Find me on Facebook or call or text me, Rain Shaddy, with FC Tucker Bloomington Realtors at 765-623-9093. Now that warm weather has arrived, it's time to hit the links, and there's no better place than the Golf Club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. Voted best golf course by the readers of the Bloomington Herald Times, the Golf Club at Eagle Point is under new ownership, has new fairways and bunkers, and it's open to the public. When the round's over, there's cold beer and a full menu at the Eagle Point Pub and Bistro. Call 812-824-1100 to make a tea time. That's 812-824-1100. The Golf Club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. 
This is AJ Moyer. This is Dan Dockett. Hey, this is Michael Lewis, former Indiana basketball player. This is Indiana football coach Tom Allen. This is Jim Coyle with the Indiana Sports Beat. You can always like and follow us on Facebook. Always follow the show rebroadcast on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify. The Daily Hoosier.com is a great place to sign up for each and every day. Or, of course, on 97.7 The Ref in Evansville. Bad theater seats, cheap Halloween masks, my apartment, all things with obstructed views. Add to these large trucks and buses. 18-wheelers and large buses have big blind spots, and like my apartment, they don't always have the best view. Bus and truck drivers deal with blind spots around the entire vehicle. Always take care not to ride alongside or too close behind them. Our roads, our safety. Learn more at sharetheroadsafely.gov. Hi, this is AJ Moye, and you're listening to Indiana Sports Beat with Jim Coyle. Sports Speed with Coyle Larry coming to you here on this Tuesday, February 4th from the Golf Club Eagle Point Studios. Warming up a little bit. Chronic Hoosier joins us. Chronic, how are you, my man? I am doing well, Jim. I'm doing well. Glad to be back as always. Uh, it seems like February's here, but man, Groundhog Day came a little bit early this year, it felt like. That was uh, Saturday. It was a game we've seen, it feels like, a hundred times before. Uh, only this time we didn't wake up to see a new Jeep waiting in the driveway and go have some fun. It was, it was same old, same old for Indiana. And, uh, you know, I, I wish I could say that, that, you know, there's, there's a cause for it. Uh, it's simple that there's a way to fix it. You know, at this point, after you've seen them do the same thing so many times in a row now, um, you know, some teams are built for the road. Some teams ain't, I'm not quite sure that this team just isn't in the latter category. Yeah. And, uh, they had gotten themselves to a point where they were pretty solidly in the tournament, and, and they still are right now. Uh, I'm convinced of that. But as I look down the road, knowing that, well, what you just talked about with the road woes, and uh, and that leaves you zero margin uh, at home. So they have got to hold serve at home, and they've got some tough contests coming, and it's coming this week. You've got a, a Purdue, a rivalry game, which uh, Purdue's not what they usually are, but it's still it's Purdue. And then you've got a very, very difficult uh, Iowa team uh, that's going to be very tough. Yeah, you know, it's – Here's the thing with this team. We've seen them so far this season. Um, you know, usually they win by attrition more than anything they've win with. Or they've won by uh, hitting, getting the line and, and winning the battle on the glass. And what we saw this weekend, you know, this is a team, they've got to, they've got to play tough. They absolutely have to play tough. And in the event that they're not playing as tough as their opponent, they've got to be really sharp. Um, but when this team's going to be soft and when this team's going to be sloppy, they're not going to have much of a chance. Now, fortunately, that's not been the case at, at, at home often where you see that, that deadly combination of soft and sloppy. That, that seems to rear its head more often on the road. Uh, but I'll tell you what, man, even when Purdue's down, uh, only a full bet's against playing, you know, not playing as tough or tougher than Purdue and expecting to beat them. That's Matt Painter's made a career out of out-toughing better teams, uh, playing smarter than better teams, and finding a way to steal victory. So, you know, if, if Indiana's got one thing going in their favor, they are a completely different team at home for the most part. Uh, the Magic Assembly Hall is still very much a real thing. The way that energy transfers from the crowd onto the players, especially at high leverage moments. Um, and I, I don't know that you can emphasize that enough with this team. You know, their ability when, when faced with adversity to find a way to counter punch, to find a way to stay within range. You know, in, in Columbus, I think it was sometime just after around the 17 minute mark. Uh, where I thought they started off pretty good. Uh, I actually thought the first you know, three, four minutes, Indiana looked pretty good. But once Ohio State kind of settled in, I think they rattled off like an 18-3 to run. And, and Indiana was never in contact from that point on. And that's something that they absolutely cannot do on the road. Fortunately, when they come home, they have a little more, uh, a little more durability 
uh, when they encounter that type of challenge. But, you know, the best thing of all is don't put yourself in that position to begin with. You know, keep running your stuff more than anything. Keep defending. Keep rebounding. Uh, keep being aggressive as far as getting the basketball inside, whether it be off the dribble or through the post feeds. And they got to find a way to get themselves in line. You know, they've there's enough tape on 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 film right now where Archie can point to numerous examples of them doing the right thing and them doing exactly what they don't need to be doing. Uh, they've got to take those lessons to heart. They get a bye week this week, so hopefully any injury, you know, effectively a bye week, uh, which to me is ridiculous considering we have to start in you know beginning of December in order to get all these games in. But that's neither here nor there. You know, they, they need to uh, they need to regroup right now. They need to look each other in the eye, uh, recognizing they have ten games guaranteed left this season. That's it. Uh, between nine regular season games remaining, there's only one Big Ten tournament game that's guaranteed for them. So, as Archie said in the press conference, you know, the story's still not done. They still have a chance to write their ending here. Uh, but they need to figure out real fast exactly how they want that to go because this can get away from them real quick, as you said, with the upcoming schedule. Yeah, especially when you play in a conference like the Big Ten. Not only that, but you have a lot of teams that are also going to be fighting for for spots that Indiana's fighting for. Uh, th- these teams at the bottom, Minnesota, Wisconsin, these guys are gonna, all going to be scrapping for, for that last couple of NCAA tournament spots because it's going to get pretty competitive then at the end, I'm pretty sure. Oh, no, absolutely. You know, it wasn't it wasn't terribly detrimental um at this point, I mean, obviously, they're still pretty much smack in the middle of the season. That was the midway point for them, or at least they rounded the halfway point. You know, had an opportunity to end up at six and five, which would have put them in a tie for uh, with Wisconsin, I believe, for eighth, um, seventh. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, instead they drop one game back. Um, at the end of the day, though, the cumulative nature of all that. Now they find themselves tied with Purdue and Minnesota. Uh, somewhere in that that cluster is probably the cut line for the tournament as far as how many teams this conference is going to put in. Um, so, you know, they are effectively, even though most bracketologists won't tell you right now, based off the body of work that they are on the outside looking in, or even that they're at the bubble at this point, but pragmatically looking forward at the road ahead, you've got to recognize you cannot slide another spot down in this conference right now um, and expect to have any comfort come Selection Sunday. Uh, this is, they, they still find themselves in a position where they control their own destiny right now. They've just got to find a way to grit it out. And you know, more than anything, they got to find a way to get back to what brought them success earlier in the year. Absolutely. Another team that uh, is not going to have to worry about uh, how high or making the NCAA play tournament is the women's team. They're, they are cruising along, Chronic, and uh, they continue to do so. They win last night over Purdue. A nice uh, – At Purdue. At Purdue, on the road. road. So a sweep, a sweep, a season sweep on top of that. So uh, Indiana is now sitting uh, fourth place in the, in the Big Ten, with a, a, a still with a shot to win the Big Ten championship. Now, nah, you know, and this is a team that it, in so many ways kind of resembles the men's. Um, they just have, a, they have the ability to get back to their level a lot quicker. And obviously they hit a little bit of a rough patch there in the middle of the season with that three-game skid. Um uh, but, you know, they are built on similar principles. You know, they're going to play really, really tough defense for 40 minutes if they're doing what their coach says. Uh, they're going to share the ball. Uh, they're going to rebound. Uh, and, you know, they've, they found a way to get back to it. It's, it's definitely possible. Now, you can make the argument that uh, perhaps they're a little better situated uh, as far as a leadership standpoint. I think that's one thing that really stands out, uh, for me at least, in the way that they've been able to kind of regain their composure right now. Uh, there's a lot of leadership on that floor, a lot of leadership in that locker room. And this isn't a knock on the men's team. This isn't a knock on the coaches. I'm just talking about experienced players that have been there before and, and you know know how to pick their teammates back up, know how to go out there and set the example and, and get others to follow. And you probably saw that as, as well as you're going to see this season. Uh, going into that gym is no joke, uh, men's or women's. Mackey is not an easy place to go in and play. And, you know, the Hoosiers basically never let them in it. They, they basically took that gym out as much as they tried to stay in it. Uh, you know, just barely kept Purdue at arm's reach pretty much from the tip onward. So kudos to them for figuring it out, for getting back on track. And uh, like you said, man, there's still the, the, a whole lot of, of, of ceiling above them as far as where they can finish the season, what their potential has in store for them. Um, but kind of like the men right now, you know, if they want to achieve that, they got to keep it rolling. Absolutely. Uh, How did you enjoy the Super Bowl this year? 
Man, I absolutely, I thought it was great. Uh, I thought it was an absolutely fun game. It's been a fun playoff. You know, it's always, it, it's always nice to watch games where you don't necessarily have a vested stake in it. Uh, you know, it was, you can maybe make the opposite argument. It'd be just as true. Uh, but you know, for, for having no dog in the hunt more than anything, uh, I just, two really good teams. Uh, I, I felt like it was, it was everything you could have hoped for. It was quick. I enjoyed that element of it as well. It wasn't, you know, a real drawn out production. Uh, they just got after it. Um, you know, it was great to see, great to see Andy Reid get a win. Great to see Dylan McCullough, uh, find himself champion of the world, man. Uh, you will, you'd be hard pressed to find a better person in, in all of football at any level than what, uh, DMC it, it is, what he's about. Uh, just one of the most remarkable personal stories you will ever, ever hear. Uh, and just how crazy for him to find himself at the top of the mountain, but had to climb over Tevin Coleman and, and, and Tevin's 49ers to get there. Uh, and how crazy is it, as difficult as it is, to get to that point in, in the professional ranks of football uh, and not only get a crack at the Super Bowl, but, but have it within reach and fall short twice. So, you know, really bittersweet from the Hoosier side of you. Uh, you know, happy for... Uh, for Coach McCullough, just you know, crestfallen for for Tevin, but speaks volumes too about how that kid's made, man. Because uh, you know he dislocated his shoulder, and two weeks later, there he's competing at the highest level in all of the sport, uh, and did really really well until his usage just kind of dropped off there in the second half. But uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit, man. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I'm a little sad right now, you know, that hangover. The football's over. Uh, but heck, weather outside, it feels like baseball season started last week. So excited to see that fire up here soon, too. But not wishing away basketball by any means yet. It's funny you say that because the next thing I was going to say to you is guess where I was yesterday. I know, man. It's here. I mean, it's absolutely here. We play baseball this month. Yeah, I was out there yesterday and uh, talking to the players, and uh, well, we have some of that to talk to Gabe Beerman, Coach Mercer, several of the other guys, and uh, they open up next week at LSU. Yeah, we are ten days away, and I'll tell you what, man, that is uh, that's no joke as far as how you start your season. Uh, it's always been been a, a struggle for Big Ten teams, uh, you know, starting starting baseball in the middle of February. I mean, in the average year, man, you you can't even practice outside right now without winter coats and bundled up. And and here they are going down to SEC country, down to the bayou, uh, where these guys maybe never have to go inside except for when it's raining out. So it's uh, – I'll tell you what, give credit to Coach Mercer for, uh, for stacking the schedule the way he has. It's not uncommon for Indiana to spend the first month or so on a road swing, which is really, really difficult – uh, not just because some of those competitive disadvantages with the weather, but you know we we got to keep in mind, man. These these are student athletes. They still got classes and exams and just all the rigors of uh, of college life, and they basically get to live out of hotel rooms here for the next month. You know, bouncing back to town as quickly as they can to get caught up on stuff. But it is certainly a grind. It certainly is a uh, is a, a really tough way to start the season, but. You know, once again, uh, high hopes for the uh, for the baseball Hoosiers defending Big Ten champs here, and just what they might be able to accomplish this year. Absolutely, but Chronic Man, I cannot thank you enough as always. We greatly appreciate you. Hope you have a great week, and uh, look forward to doing this again next week. Hey, likewise. I think we're uh, we're dropping a new pod tomorrow. Zach and I've got one of the books. Uh, really looking forward to after the Purdue game. Uh, I've got to go attend a little mixer, but then uh, I'm hoping to dip over to Switchyard and go catch the back end of the uh, the Assembly Hall live broadcast over there. Uh, it, it looks to be a really good time, free admission. Uh, folks are out and about after the game. You should definitely go over there. Check out what Jared and the boys, I think Dr. Clavio is going to be joining them. Uh, should be a good time. Hopefully we'll have some cause to celebrate. We'll all raise a pint and, uh, and look forward to getting back to 500 in the conference. There you go. Sounds like a festive occasion and a great time to do so. Chronic Cozier joining us here on Indiana Sports Beat. We can't thank you enough. We'll be back with more to the Golf Club Eagle Point Studios right after this. Hello. 
Hello, everybody. Jim Coyle from Indiana Sports Speed. When I'm not covering the Hoosiers, you can find me at Bubba's 33 in Clarksville, located on the northeast corner of I-65 at Veterans Parkway. Bubba's 33 has hand-tossed pizzas, bold burgers, and ice-cold beer from a select list of local craft brewers. An incredible food selection, all made fresh daily. Whether you're meeting the team for that post-win meal in the family dining area or meeting friends for happy hour to watch the game on one of Bubba's 50 TVs, Bubba's 33 in Clarksville. Pizza, burgers, beer. We all want a winning smile for those championship photos, and that's exactly what you will get at Reynolds Family Dentistry in Sellersburg. Reynolds Family Dentistry has been serving the dental needs of Hoosier families for over 30 years. Let Drs. Roger and Jay Reynolds take care of your family. Just off of I-65 at 809 South Indiana Avenue in Sellersburg. Call 812-246-3368. That's Reynolds Family Dentistry, 812-246-3368. I'm Rain Shaddy, and I'm a Hoosier. As a toddler, you could always find me running around in a cream and crimson onesie and a red IU hat reminiscent of those worn during the world-famous William Tell timeout, shouting, Go Hoosiers! Like many other alum, I chose to make Bloomington my home. As a civic and alumni leader, I have become very knowledgeable about our community and would love to share my insights with you as your realtor. Find me on Facebook or call or text me, Ryan Shaddy, with FC Tucker Bloomington Realtors at 765-623-9093. Now that warm weather has arrived, it's time to hit the links, and there's no better place than the golf club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. Voted best golf course by the readers of the Bloomington Herald Times, the golf club at Eagle Point is under new ownership, has new fairways and bunkers, and it's open to the public. When the round's over, there's cold beer and a full menu at the Eagle Point Club and Bistro. Call 812-824-1100 to make a tea time. That's 812-824-1100. The golf club at Eagle Point in Bloomington. This is AJ Moyer. This is Dan Docker. Hey, this is Michael Lewis. I'm an Indiana basketball player. This is Indiana football coach. Tom this is Jim Coyle with Indiana Sports Beat. You can always like and follow us on Facebook. Always follow the show rebroadcast on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify. The DailyHoosier.com is a great place to sign up for each and every day. Or, of course, on 97.7 The Ref in Evansville. Bad theater seats, cheap Halloween masks, my apartment, all things with obstructed views. Add to these large trucks and buses. 18-wheelers and large buses have big blind spots, and like my apartment, they don't always have the best view. Bus and truck drivers deal with blind spots around the entire vehicle. Always take care not to ride alongside or too close behind them. Our roads, our safety. Learn more at sharetheroadsafely.gov. This is former Indiana basketball player Greg Green. Keep up with the Hoosiers on Indiana Sports Beat with Jim Coyle. There's not a lot of pressure on a first-year coach, but when you win the Big Ten Championship in your first year and come back in the second year, what's that like? Thanks for reminding me. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, no, it, I, I, it obviously was, was a lot of fun last year. We played well down the stretch, and, and we were able to, to, to do some really, some really good things. Uh, you know, going into the second year, it's, it's like I always say, it's baseball. And so each year is a journey, and I know it's super cliche, but, but it is, and this is going to be its own team, just like last year was its own team, and you know, we're, we're going to have to analyze, and, and, and certainly – you, you, your, your best laid plans often go awry, and so I'm sure we have all these great plans, and I'm sure they'll all, you know, go, uh, you know, uh, go to hell. But but we'll, we'll have to figure it out along the way. So it it, it certainly is. Um, it's a lot of fun to be able to come in and work with a group of guys that have had success and that that have an expectation of, of winning, and then to be able to, to build off of that is is a great challenge. There's Coach Jeff Mercer, Indiana's baseball coach, as I uh, was out at. Uh, Bart Kaufman Stadium yesterday, Todd, for baseball practice on a nice day. It was nice. It was they were out there in, in their short sleeve shirts playing and throwing. It was crazy. Uh, yeah, yeah. The they could do that again today, maybe, and <laughs> maybe it's supposed to rain all day. But but then temperature wise, it's going to take a dive here before long. So we'll be back to practicing inside. I'm sure for those guys. Absolutely, but uh, they've got a lot to replace. 
uh, for, from last year as the Big Ten championship team. They had a lot of power last year, man. They were second in the country in home runs, Todd. They went yard a lot, and it was fun. They got a lot coming back, but it's going to be interesting to see. I think uh, in talking to Coach Mercer, they're going to probably play a little, if he has the option, to play a small ball a little bit more, a little more exciting. So uh, not that home runs aren't exciting. They are, but I think you may see a little bit of both this year. Yeah, I mean, you brought up a, a good point to him, and, you know, coming in in your first year and winning the Big Ten, I mean, it's it's difficult to, you know, to back that up. And but I mean, you know, this is this is a team that uh, once you start that culture, once you start the the idea of of winning, um, you know, the younger players that were there will will you know they'll breed off of that and they'll they'll bring other guys in and um, you know it'll be exciting to see what they can do in their second year. That's the fun part is is after they had such a successful year last year. Uh, to see how they can come back and back that up. Yeah, I got to see some of the guys yesterday. Gabe Beerman, uh, one of my homeboys, he's uh, down from Southern Indiana. His, uh, his dad went to uh, Floyd Central, actually, and Gabe lost his dad last year, but a very emotional year for him. He was a freshman, Todd, and if you were around with us last year, this dude, as a freshman, come in and pitched in tight spots. While he, he lost his father, his father passed away unexpectedly during the season. Uh, and his kid kept pitching and uh, as a freshman, no less. And so he's going through all this stuff, being a freshman, being a freshman athlete, and then being a freshman athlete in a pressure situation with all that he had going on in his personal life. You talk about a kid that has grown up so much and uh, looking forward to big things for him this year, man. He's going to be uh, a good one. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've got to, you know, assume – you never know how you know players are going to react in that situation. You've got to assume baseball was probably good for him in that scenario because, you know, I mean, how do how do you deal with something like that? I mean, it's just you know he's you assume as a kid he's you know probably growing up throwing baseball with his dad forever and you know you just it's one of those scenarios you can only probably guess last year's success in the season was probably you know therapeutic for him and being out there and the only sense of normalcy he had in his life at that point. Absolutely. It, uh, it's like, you know, teams, that's it's one of the things that sports offers in life, uh, especially for guys, because, you know, women are a little bit more emotional. They're more apt to be supportive where guys, they, they get that, I think, a lot through sports and through sporting teams because you're bonded so much that uh, it, it permeates everything. Yeah, you know, I hate to I hate to like flip it off the serious topic, but I mean, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier in the mental side of things. Because when you can go, you know, when you can fully engross yourself mentally into what you're doing from your sports perspective, you know, that, that's when you've got a tragic situation going on, or you've just got family problems in general, stuff that we all deal with on a regular basis. You know, you you when you can go to sport and you can take your mind off of completely focus on something you love to do and you enjoy and uh it you know it it keeps your mind fully focused on that um you know that's that's therapeutic for you in a situation like that and and that's what you know that's why I I believe so much in the mental aspect of it and I'm really happy to hear Archie Miller talk about you know the guy cuz I I believe it the guys physically I mean we're good enough to Indians good enough to win they really are. They should most every game. I don't see too many teams they line up across from and they're physically outmatched. So then at that point it becomes their you know their mental aspect and their schemes and what they're what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, uh, and hopefully they can get that turned around because they're going to have the chance. But uh, that the time is the sand in the hourglass. It's starting to to start to run down as as and it'll start running faster as the season starts to progress. Now here on this back half of the conference season because things are going to start getting determined and people are going to start finding their place. Teams are going to yeah, start I mean, finding their place. That, they're at that hump. I mean, they're either going <laughs> to – things are going to start going well or, or you know, that they're going to struggle. Well, hopefully they don't struggle. Hey, tomorrow well, – I, I know. I'm hoping not. <laughs> no, I know. Hey, I can't remember if I mentioned this in the first hour or not, but to tomorrow on the program, big day, man. Christian Watford on the show. Why not? Watch, you know that you, and I can't kind of forget. Don't let me forget to ask him about. You know they they do that thing at halftime now with the fan re, fans recreating the watch shot is right. one of the contests right. they do, which is, is kind of funny. Is he getting, is he getting a, a payment off of that? Royalties getting royalties. Gonna ask <laughs> him. royalties for that. He, maybe he can you start know, doing that around the country. You know it's funny in Newburgh. Uh, I was following a car yesterday, 
actually the day before yesterday, I was following a car and the license plate on the car said Watt for the win. And it was the real license plate. It said Watt, W-A-T, number four, W-I-N, I think, Watt for the win. Yeah, it was, Watt for it the was win. pretty wow. cool. That's how, that, but I mean, that's, that's what I want. Like, I wish you could get the kids that are there now to understand how important this is to everybody. Like when, when, when we talk about, we want them to play hard and do all this stuff. I mean, think about somebody on their license plate of their car. Why the win? That's how important that was to them at some point in time in their life. Like it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, if they would understand, I mean, they need to go back and look at the, the era of your, your era, go back to the teams before that. And, and even right shortly after that, even in the early part of the Tom Crean era, when Indiana was so down because of what had happened, but the fans weren't, the fans did not leave. And that kind of support, my gosh, if you can maintain that, that that's not, most programs could not withstand that. Most programs yeah. would have wilted and died. But this is not. This is a a blue blood program. I don't care what anybody says. It is a blue blood program, and that's why when people ask that that question, when well, Indiana's not a blue blood, the bull crap. Yeah, they are. That's why CBS and ESPN still make them marquee games because they are. That's why that you see when Forbes does those reports that Indiana's one of the top three most valued college basketball or college franchises in sports uh, it, because they are a blue blood, and that shows you. And that's without having done anything of note for 25 years. Can you imagine what it would be, the fever pitch, if they were maintaining that standard of when you were playing? Yeah, I mean, that that's what, um, you know, you can't become a blue blood in, in 10 or 15 or even 20 years. I mean, you know, Gonzaga has had an incredible run in how well they've played. They're not a blue blood. Butler. But they've been as they've been as successful. At Butler, I mean, and, and I'm not saying that to rip Butler every time I say that. No, I know. I'm I'm, I'm great. Yeah, exactly. I agree with everything. I know but what you're saying. I agree. You can't be. You can't lose being a blue blood in 25 years, and you can't gain becoming a blue blood in 25 years. And so, that's the part of it where you know people are saying, "Yeah, Indiana is on the down tick of <laughs> of how they're playing." I'm not going to disagree with that, but. They're, you know, they're a blue blood, no matter how you want to look at it. And, and I think and, that the one thing that people may not understand is why I, I think Indiana will always be a blue blood. I don't know that I can say that about every blue blood, most probably, because once you are, it's like being royalty. Once you are, you are. But yeah. this is because this state eats, breathes, sleeps the sport of basketball. It starts at the elementary school level. It, it's it's every day. It's it's something that that's so many people live their lives around in this state. It's not just success by a college basketball team, which you can say about some other places. Uh, Kentucky, for example, they're, they're not a high school basketball state. They don't produce great talent. Indiana is a great basketball state that produces unbelievable talent. If you go back through the annals of time, look at every year how much talent Indiana produces puts out on division one rosters it's nuts per capita it's crazy oh it, and there's i mean here's you know here's just one of the things to look at is it's not just the the indiana mr basketballs and the indiana all-stars and the guys like that like i'm telling you as a high school basketball player in indiana i can't tell you how many kids how many guys i played against that were so ridiculously talented and never made the all-star team and and half the time weren't even the most talented player on the team. I mean, a guy named Ron Bayless that played with Greg Graham at Warren Central. I mean, that dude was as tough to play against as anybody. Pike always had, you know, ridiculously good Ron Rutland and just ridiculously good players. So it's the it's the quantity of really good players. I mean, you're looking at Indiana rosters in high school and I mean, there, there's times when you've got guys who are, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten deep that that end up playing, you know, college basketball somewhere. And it, that's just the incredible part. I mean, you take other states, and I think they've got, you know, there'll be teams that have really talented top one or two guys on their team, but the level of play for teams, you know, in Indiana is just it's crazy. I mean, I, I, that's why I just truly wish they would put the shot clock in because that would that would force coaches to to coach differently right now coaches want to keep their jobs and i get that um but the the level of basketball or the, not the level the the style of basketball is just crap because you get you get some coaches if they want to slow a team down i mean they'll they'll try to turn it into a 20 to 16 game 
We just and saw just, a clip on Twitter miserable. like the other day, I think. I don't know where it was from. I'm not saying it was from Indiana. It may have been. I, I don't recall. But they were showing a clip of a game where a kid standing out, out there in the corner of the, you know, the backcourt corner holding the ball and yeah. waiting for the clock, just watching the clock tick down. And it's just ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, here's the thing. Like we, so back in, back in my day, back whenever, uh, I'll be Bill Walton here for a minute. We would go play, Hush your we, mouth. we would go play Noblesville. You know, we had, you know, we had Eric Montross. He was the, he was the star. Like, believe me, when we were selling gyms out, it wasn't because of me. It was because of Eric Montross. And I, I fully understand that, but we had a pretty good show. I mean, people wanted to watch us play. We were, we would score, you know, 70, 80, 90 points in a game. And people wanted to watch that. And we go play Noblesville, and the score at the end of the first quarter is 2-0. to zero. We scored on the first possession, and they, did, they held the ball for the whole quarter because they just wanted to slow it down and make it as slow a game as possible. And it's just like when you can have a coach affect a game like that, that's not basketball. That's not – there's no strategy involved in that. His strategy is just trying to make it ugly. And nobody that came to that game, even from Noblesville, wanted to watch that. They literally stood at half court and dribbled for the entire quarter. And that's just – that, that kind of stuff has to change in high school basketball for India. That, that, that's where, you know, we were talking earlier of all the stuff about the, uh, the NCAA and how, you know, a lot of the decisions they've made have not made a lot of sense and things like that. I mean, the IHSAA is the epitome of bad decisions. I mean, they, they are, you could take what the IHSAA does and multiply it by a thousand for, a, for when you want to talk about situations that are black and white and, you know, they can, they can, there's a gray area and they can decide whatever they want. The IHSAA does that worse than any organizations in sports, in my opinion. Yep. I, I cannot disagree with you. I cannot disagree with you, but uh, always plenty to uh, uh, debate on that subject. And, it, and it's a subject that never goes away. Yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, the, the here's the, here's what I would love for them to be able to say it is, you know, uh, I think it was Dustin that was on there talking about, the NCAA likes to be, or the Big Ten likes to be kind of on the forefront of, of decisions and the way that things are trending and the way things are going in basketball and football. And, you know, the, the Big Ten came up with the Big Ten Network and then the ACC and SEC and all these other places followed. And, you know, you want to look at it, you want to be like, at what point, like, how could they come up with a reason of why the shot clock would not be instituted in high school basketball in Indiana? What, what reason could possibly make any sense that it doesn't happen? I, I don't know. That that, do you have one? Do you, have, do you even know what they would argue? No, I, not, not legit. I, I could come up with one that's not legit. I mean, I can see uh, some small teams or some weak teams saying, well, we can't compete with uh, half the people on our schedule, this, that. Or, but it's not valid. And, and then, you know, don't. Then don't. Don't play. Go, go do something else. Play checkers. You know, not in basketball. Yeah, I guess. but I mean, it, I don't see how competing – I don't see how the shot clock would make you compete. Like that's that style of basketball is not. Um, it, it, it's not. It, it, it's only going to come up when you got a, a team that is completely outmatched and playing a normal style of basketball is no chance. Where they think that they're going to get virtually every shot blocked, well, uh, uh, I mean, they're going to lose every on. rebound. But uh, but I'll I'll make this like I I disagree with that statement a little bit because I'll I'll bring this make it a little bit more personal for a minute and I'll take I'll say. Carmel basketball, where my son plays right now, like they, they play a very slow-paced style of basketball. They have a bunch of players that have gone through there. Ryan Klein, um, they have had some enormously talented players that have gone through there, and they just play such a slow-paced style of basketball that literally only one or two players ever have a chance. The leading scorer on Carmel's team will average less than 15 points a game. I mean, that's, that might have been cool back in the Hoosiers days, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but that's not the way basketball is played anymore. And it, they don't slow it down to where they try, you know, they, they try to make it a, a 20 to 16 type of game, but they try to score under 40 points a game. They're trying to make it that slow of a game. And that doesn't help your players get recognized. and get. That's why, truly, and this is the honest truth, that's why AAU basketball is more important than high school basketball nowadays when it comes to recruiting. Because coaches know that a player's stats don't really mean anything in high school because it's it's all affected by this the you know how their coach plays. Which and in me, AAU they get out and they score and they run up and down and they do all kinds of, they can actually see what players are capable of doing. 
In the Carmel situation, that seems crazy because there's no school in the state that has more athletes than Carmel does. Oh, yeah. So Carmel's they have got, to have the best a, athletes in the world. Shooters, they got a bunch of shooters and scorers and long guys. And, and, but the difference is, is in order for them to compete against the Lawrence North, I mean, they play Lawrence North on Thursday. I mean, that'll be, that'll be a good example because if they try to slow it down against Lawrence North, they'll lose by 30. They tried to slow it down against Lawrence Central, lost by 30. Like, you can't, you can't compete against teams like that. And, and play that system of basketball. But that's the only, you know, running up and down and scoring is the only chance they have of, of playing in a game like that. Looking at a tweet right now that uh, was the North Carolina-Florida State game yesterday, but the, the shot clock's running down, and the referee points it out to the to the North Carolina player with the ball. It was uh, Anthony. No way. Yeah, he's like, you can see him going, he points. He doesn't just point once and stop. He's like, there's like a double point. He's, he, and so you can see he's pointing at the shot the clock. Referee? The referee? The referee, referee yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and Mike that. DeCourcy commented on it. He goes, it happens all the time. Really? Um, yeah. He Pulled probably, my, he probably the, the, the ref probably had money on the over. He needed more points going in. It just, <laughs> yeah. It, I, it should, was, I it, shouldn't say that. I take that back. That it was, was early. In, it was with about six six fifty to go in the first half of that game. Uh, Anthony's got the ball. And he gives it up and he gets it back. And he's outside the three-point line. And then all of a sudden you see the ref point, like moving his hand a couple of times at the shot clock. And then play continues. And – he gets a sh- he tries to get a shot off and gets blocked, but that's weird. Uh, it's, yeah, that's that's wild. Oh well. Hey man, uh, it's going to pretty much wrap it up today. Another great show, but uh, going to be even better tomorrow on the program. Christian Watford is going to join us. The watch shot. Watch uh, out. Looking forward to that. Can't wait. That's going to be exciting, man. Of course, Matt Weaver is going to join us. It is college football signing day. So uh, we'll be talking about that as well. So plenty more to get to tomorrow, man. I can't thank everybody enough today. Dustin Schutte from uh, Saturday Tradition, Chronic Hoosier for joining us as well. Of course, Jake keeping us on the track. And my running mate, Todd Larry. Thanks, man. Until then, for all those guys, I'm Jim Coyle, and I will see you on the radio.